This might seem a little bit random, but as we bid adieu to the spring, uh, I would be remiss to not mention this little, this will sound kind of churchy, glory reports. I, I don't know what else to call it. But there were four shrubs, trees in our own little yard that in the past month went from like bare, like is this bush dead kinds of, you know, kind of appearance to like, exploding with some of the most beautiful colors I've ever seen. Like right in our yard, it kind of quietly going boom. And I thought, well, look at that. Uh, I've assorted leaves are now settling to various hues of green, right? But then a mere five months or so, and those New Englanders will, will know what's coming, right? It, it's, it will take our breath away as these same leaves just go Boom, again, with colors that are like stunning. Just noticing, I'm like, so why did, what's the purpose other than, I think this is the purpose. I think that occasionally in different ways through creation, God will simply say, I can take something that, that is barren. I can take something that is dormant and turn it into something that is and beautiful. That's, that's what God does. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about today a little bit. So let's take a moment to pray that our time together in God's presence, considering his word, would stir and awaken us in a similar way that, that we humans uh, can experience. Let's pray. Father, the psalmist wrote that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaim his handiwork. King David focused on the firmament. We are content to acknowledge these humble azaleas, dogwood, apple, and cherry trees that are doing the very same thing. We too want to declare with all of our hearts that you are good and that you are worthy of our praise. So speak to us, O oh God, we pray, in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we were missing a, a sermon bumper video, so sorry about that, uh, because uh, we're in between. Uh, Pastor Adam, with a, a cameo from Pastor Donnie last week, I just finished a sermon series entitled Moneyology, and it was so good, it was so helpful. Uh, Pastor, I've actually put a paper out. If you haven't checked that out, it's, it's just excellent. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to start, we're going to dive into the New Testament letter. One of my favorites, James, splash some Proverbs down in, in there. And we're going to uh, get, uh, again, hopefully something that's encouraging and, and super practical and helpful, right? So we are in between. This is like a free skate Sunday. Uh, now, here's the thing. Um, I can assure you that I uh, cannot skate, and uh, my, you know, no figure skater here, but I do know how to plod ahead in life. I can plod, and I can put one foot in front of the other, and today we're going to plod along while we focus on what is my absolute favorite prayer in all of the Bible. So I've entitled the, the message, The Greatest Prayer We Can Pray for Ourselves and Each Other. And you might be saying, that sounds a little bit like clickbait. And I will say, and I'll say, no, it's not, though I'm not above that. I, I'm, it's a, it's not. And I hope to demonstrate that, that, that that title is accurate. And others of you, especially if you're a little hangry this morning or woke up on the Sunday, go, wait a second. Pastor Don, uh, you're saying this is the greatest prayer. What about that prayer when, you know, the disciples asked Jesus, uh, Lord, teach us to pray, and he gave us the Lord's Prayer, right? Which many of us have memorized and many of us use as a template, right, to pray. We're going to look at it for just a moment, uh, just to, to notice some things uh, about it. But, but what I want to say um, is that, you know, that the prayer that we're about to look at after the Lord's Prayer is a little different, and, and we'll explain why. Now, if you're new to Christianity, you might not be familiar with the Lord's Prayer, so I want to put it up on the screen here, and let's take a look at it together. I included the little preface 
uh, to give us a little bit of context in Jesus' sermon that he was preaching at the time. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, Jesus' temple for prayer, uh, not surprisingly, sounds like a lot of our prayers, right? It sounds like the, I, I pray... Uh, real-time, uh, immediate need, expedient, or even urgent kinds of prayers all the time. And so do you. I, I, when I'm reading uh, most of your connection cards, when you put your prayers down there and we read them and pray them, you're praying for specific things. You're asking God for very specific, immediate kinds of things. This is obviously good. God wants us to bring everything to him in our lives everything. And so we do. The Lord's Prayer really is like 90% about these kinds of, of needs that we have as humans, right? Wisdom and direction, a provision. We need provision, right? Grace to forgive one another as we collide uh, with one another. Uh, uh, strength to resist very real temptations and protection from the very real enemy of our souls. Those are very specific prayers that we pray. Jesus gave us permission. He even encouraged us to pray in these ways. You might, we could classify these prayers, since we're going to create two categories here. We could classify these prayers as kind of creature-oriented or, or kind of flowing from mere creatures up to God, right? So they're going from down here uh, up there to the, the very throne room. And this is precisely where Paul's prayer to the, for the Ephesians and, and, and model and showing, demonstrating this prayer is different because the prayer that we're about to look like, it fits this category. They're more like God, hearts for, designed for, wisdom, big picture, praying for us. They're kind of top down. The, 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 in, in that way, then I would argue they're better than our prayers, as good as they are from our limited perspective in a moment in time. These are bigger picture. And, and I would say this is what makes this prayer so incredible. I should say a quick word about the prayer life of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was, uh, let's say his prayer life was robust. Uh, to say the least. When I checked to see how often Paul referred specifically to prayer in some way, shape, or form, pray for this, pray for me, I'm praying for you. There's like two dozen occasions in his letters when he explicitly talks about prayer. Prayer was very much something he did. It was on his mind. There's also 40 specific prayers that are in those same letters. 40 specific prayers that Paul is praying. If you want to learn how to pray, by the way, and want to go next level, study Paul's prayers. It's a wonderful way to, to learn to pray. The Psalms do that for us, right, on some level, but this is, this is next level. Now, Paul, here, here's the thing. When, when I read him, I'm like, wait, wait a second. Paul was an intercessor. He just was. And you're like, well, you might not know what an intercessor is. I'll try to explain it. I've lived with one for 28 years. My wife is an intercessor. I know what intercessors do. Intercessors pray a lot all the time. They hear rather easily from God. Their prayers are pretty powerful and they've got faith around them. My wife is a better prayer than I am. I've been trying to catch up for 28 years. And I'm not exaggerating at all. It's a, it's a gifting, part of the body of Christ. And the thing about intercessors is, and thank you if you're one of them, is that they're, they're doing this work on our behalf and nobody knows often. No one even knows. In fact, you didn't know this, but there are a group of intercessors that have been praying every Sunday morning upstairs in the chapel for you and for me. So that's 
what an intercessor does, right? So Paul, of course, included some very real prayers uh, in, in those requests. I just, uh, here's a couple of them. I pray now that at last, by God's will, that the door will be open for me to come and visit you, church in Rome. So it's a specific prayer, right? I pray that you'll be active in sharing your faith. That's Philemon, this tiny little letter. He's like, I'm praying for you that you will kind of go after it. Uh, he also prayed for himself. Pray for me that words may be given me when opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So he is asking for prayer. So Paul was asking for specific things as well, right? But there's this other category of prayer. Prayers that reflect a deep spiritual kind of wisdom and understanding. Again, big picture. And, and, and when we're studying them, uh, I, my hope is that they will become, if they're not already, a part of our prayer life. I'm hoping that we're not just praying for the immediate and the expedient. I'm, pray, I'm hoping that, that our, our prayer kind of ability and repertoire will, will widen and, and we will become even better prayers. So let's take a look at the, the with that kind of introduction, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Paul said, for this reason, I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There is one tiny little conjunction that's repeated uh, in this prayer that basically divides the prayer up into three prayers. Three prayers in one, which sounds kind of familiar and very biblical, right? Conjunctions serve a function. And so, and sorry. And so they do here. Uh, the, the first uh, prayer, uh, let's take a little zoom in. We'll, we'll start with the, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Let's stop there for a moment. For what reason? Why is he going to prayer at this moment in time? Well, if you're familiar with Ephesians, you know how rich, amazing Ephesians 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2. Uh, if you want uh, some good reading this week, study Ephesians. In the beginning, he reflects on the gospel, Jesus, the gospel, and the fact that this gospel is not just for Jews, but it's for Gentiles as well. So that's underneath this mixed kind of audience in, in Ephesus. And so, and these are friends, right? He planted the church. He's writing from prison now, but he's writing them and saying, here's the main thing that he said in the first chapter. The second best prayer or equal prayer is in chapter one. Check it out as well. You know what the gist of that prayer is? Kind of he raises the question in the beginning and says, Christians, do you have any idea who you are? Do you know what you have in Jesus and the inheritance that you've received? Not just future, but like now. Do you have any idea? And then he prays that for them. So when he's reflecting back and saying, he, he's, he's building is what I'm saying. And this prayer, I believe, is like this high point, this very, very high point. So, so don't miss the journey up the mountain to get to this prayer, is what I'm saying. But I'll leave it uh, for you to, to study there. So what does he say? The first prayer request in this first portion, there's two clauses, two sentences that, that are independent, but they're the same. I want to try to demonstrate that for a minute. I'll have to go just a little bit nerdy as best as I can just to explain uh, why the current translation, English translations we have are a little bit confusing, but they don't need to be. Um, he said that you would be, that according to the riches of his glory, God is not lacking anything in terms of glory, he may grant you to be one, strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. What does that sound like? It sounds like the Holy Spirit 
already dwelling inside of believers, right? If you're aware already in some Bible teaching around this, when we be trust Christ, God actually comes and takes up residence inside our souls, which is still to me boggles my mind. But you notice, especially if you come to faith later, you notice the difference between God's not here, that close and personal, and then God is here, <laughs> that close and personal. It's only challenging, I think, if, if you put your faith in Jesus when you're five, I'm jealous for one, but you've never known what it's like to not have God up close and personal. You just never known. And so you're not even maybe able to fully comprehend how different it is. I was 21. So there was this marked difference between there's a before and there was an after. You can't miss it. Here's the, the point here. You cannot miss it when God shows up and moves into your house. So, so if you're if you not sure where you're at in your faith and you're wondering, it's like God wants us to know that he's there and, and he'll, you, you'll be able to experience it. There'll, there'll be some level of belief and faith involved, but you'll experience some things. And if you're not sure, I'd love to talk about that kind of thing before. Anyway, so that first clause is like, and here's the, here's the good news. When God is in your house, why not ask him for help and strength? That's it. That's, that's kind of the gist of it. Ask him to strengthen you because he's right here. The second clause, again, I think is really identical. It says that so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The, the English translators, for whatever reason, again, we're talking scholars, and, and then my take is like, I, generally you want to lean with the, the real uh, mega scholars, but, but there's, I'm not sure why, there's basically like a, an, in the English, an added conjunction, the so that. The so that's not there in the sentence. It's just not there. And so, and then the may, if you're into language all, suggests kind of like a subjunctive form of the verb, right? It's not a subjunctive verb. It's a, the, the verb is capturing real-time action, kind of ongoing action. So here's how you could translate this sentence. Uh, Christ uh, dwelling in your hearts through faith. So now I'll, I'll read the two together side by side. Uh, strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, Christ dwelling in your hearts through faith. They're the same. There's not a, they're just the same. And, and the, Paul is, is really great at this, the Trinity kind of unfolding in the scriptures, you know, as we read, it's like Father, Son, Spirit all over the place in, in his writings. And, and the Son and the Spirit are interchangeable here. So when he's talking about the God's Spirit dwelling with us, it's the same thing as saying Jesus is dwelling with, is hanging out with us, is with us. Does that make sense? So, and I'm sure I've shared this before, but when the disciples, you know, we look at their examples in the gospels and we're, we're like, oh man, they just had this massive advantage. They're hanging out with Jesus. They could talk to him, you know, real time and, you know, whatever. They're watching him in the flesh, all that. It's like, okay, they had a little bit of advantage on us in that way. But Jesus actually argued in his last discourse before the, in the, the last supper, he's like, it's to your advantage that I go away because when I go away, I'm gonna spend my spirit to live inside of you. So Jesus is actually saying, you're better off going forward because I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you everywhere all the time. So not only do we have God strengthening us by his spirit in our hearts, like giving us courage or whatever we're asking for, or whatever we need, but we've got Jesus himself along for the ride with whatever we're facing. And, I, and I'm, I'm not lying to you. I live sometimes and too often like that's not true. And I'm guessing that, that you do as well. It changes the game dramatically when we know that God is with us wherever we go. It just changed the game. So that's the first part of the prayer. Uh, the, the first stop. If we were to fashion, put this in our own words, we could say, and, and turn this into our own words prayer at this point, 
Oh God, give me strength by your spirit living in me to fill in the blank. Oh Jesus, strengthen me in this moment to fill in the blank. So that's how that works. The second prayer is where really the heart of the prayer and and where I want to spend the the part that has kind of rocked me and changed my life in some ways. Let's take a look at that. This is what he says in, in two, that you, there's the, a conjunction, being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Okay, let's start with the, the little mixing of metaphors, the rooted and the grounded. The rooted, uh, uh, for any of us that have hung out in nature, the yard, whatever, any bush, shrub, there's this labyrinth of, of roots underneath the surface that you cannot see. I've had to dig out a, a dead tree or two before. I'm like, wow, look how far those roots go. And, and you're kind of hacking away and trying to uproot. That tree was not going anywhere, usually, unless a tornado comes through, because of this, this system underneath the ground. Paul is saying uh, God's love for us is like this root system underneath our lives and, and, and you will not be moved because his love will be the, and the second word he uses, the foundation underneath you, his love. I'm not talking about like having all my theology squared away perfect. What, no, it's like relationally speaking, his love is what's underneath my existence. Both verbs are also in the, the perfect tense, which means the action's been completed. And Paul does this whenever he's talking about God word, big deal things. He uses perfect verbs, which means the action's already completed, it's done. God loves you. And then the, the effects are just playing out. The ongoing effects of that reality that's finished. That's what agape love is, it's unconditional. It's, it's self-sacrificial. Uh, it's the very standard of love, highest standard. And Paul's prayer is simply this, and we could turn this into a question. Do, am I understanding, do I know just how much God loves me this morning? Am I living in that safety and the comfort and the goodness of God's love? That's a question Paul's trying to raise here. Here's the thing. We can pray, and we're supposed to pray, that God would increase our comprehension of his love for us. That's the, that's the if there's a, a main takeaway prayer request, that's the one. Oh God, I'm not feeling it. I'm not, you know, whatever, we're, however we would preface that, the, the, the heart of the prayer, we're eventually getting to this prayer. God, help me to understand and better comprehend your love for me. That's the, that's the, mm, that's the meat prayer right there. Now, here's the thing. Whenever we're praying scriptures, are praying prayers that are in the scriptures, we can have a high degree of confidence that God's gonna answer those prayers, right? You should have lots of faith around them. So here's the thing, you pray that prayer, look out, because God is going to show you in a really personal way how much he loves you. And all we're doing is we're like God, we're seeking him. We're, we're crying out. We're putting in our time to cultivate our relationship, but oh, God will not disappoint He will not disappoint you. And he'll answer it in a way that's, again, very personal and and kind of unique to you. Uh, I wanted to share one example that that was very personal. The penny dropped about, no, 10 years or so. It's regarding, uh, my wife and I have two sons, uh, Luke and Jonathan. And and we're going to, that's Jonathan just graduated from college. We're so proud of him. That was just two weeks ago. And... (laughs) And there's his brother, big brother Luke, even though he's not so big in stature. Still the big brother. One more, go ahead and slide to the next one. Okay, those two, I wanna just talk about them for a moment. By the time Jonathan was, you know, hitting around 10 years old or so, it was very apparent that he had some extraordinary abilities, and primarily in music. He just understood music. 
and he, he composed. Like from when my wife got him a keyboard A7, he was like figuring out to play two hands and within like a week or two, he was starting to compose songs. So he just had that kind of extraordinary gift. Regarding abilities that, that as humans in the world would, would acknowledge and, and appreciate, Jonathan is on one end of the spectrum and Luke is on the opposite end. He has very few abilities that, that we would count to. Or he cannot even, he can't take care of himself entirely. It, it was never really, one of the things, we'll never forget this, like seven years ago-ish, uh, both boys received permission slips to bring and, and give to us. We had to sign off on, on field trips. Here's the two field trips. Jonathan's field trip was to go with his classmates to Italy of all places, it's kind of sick. Um, to, you know, with this amazing opportunity to go to Rome and to, you know, study this and to visit this museum and to whatever. And, and we were able to send him off to Italy, sign off on the trip. Guess where Luke's field trip, our little sign off was for? It was for his class made... is for his class made up of 40 severely special needs kids to go to Five Below with 10 bucks in hand to just pick out some things in the store, some candy, whatever they would want. That is emblematic of the kinds of... just kind of remarkable. Along the way, it's like, God, he gave, me, gave us two sons and they could not be more different in terms of ability. And here, here's the thing. I love them just the same. Like I really do, completely. There's no difference in the kind of father's love that I have for my boys. There's none. It's not based on their abilities or their disabilities at all. Not at all. And this is such good news. Um, younger men labored with insecurity and performance and just all that kind of crap. I didn't realize that God just loved me, just straight up loved me because he, he just adopted me and called me his own. His love was not based on what I could do or produce. Amen. Amen. It was just there. Such is so good. And here's the thing too, right? It, it's like if Jonathan was wasting his gifts, as a father, I would get up and I'd go, son, let's talk. Like, don't go wasting gifts. But any gift that we have is just a gift, right? We didn't have anything to do with what we were gifted with or do not, right? So our responsibility is simply to be Faithful, to show up, to, to not sit on a talent, right, or bury it, right, is what Jesus talked about. It's like, no, we have a responsibility. And, and as parents, we felt the responsibility to, we saw the gifts there. We were responsible to help him cultivate the gift. That's the extent of it, though. That's it. In terms of, of being valued and being loved, nothing to do with any of that. Right. It's such good news. Such good news. That means just give it your best shot if you have talents and gifts. Give it your best shot and it's good enough. That's right. Amen. Okay. And God is jealous for us in a good way. You know, as humans, our jealousy is pettiness and it's dark. God's jealousy for us is not that. It's just, it's relationship, it's love. He's like, I loved you like this. Love me back, enter into the banquet table. Come and feast here with me. You know, there's a, um, two of the churches, Jesus showed up, 
or kind of delivered a message in Revelation 2, 3, chapters 2 and 3. Some of you are familiar with this. And gave them a bit of an assessment, a report card on how they were doing. This, is, this assessment came through John, his disciple of visions, right? After this prayer was written. So in Ephesus, the focus, right, is believers in, in Ephesus go after this. Understand how much God loves you. It, it's central, Right? So later on, you know what the letter to Jesus uh, consists of to the church in Ephesus? He said this, you all are are, are faithful in in a lot of things. You're doing well, you're showing up, you're being faithful, well done. But then he said this, he said, but I have this against you. You have lost your first love. Understand how far you have fallen. Repent of that. And get back online and seek me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's another in Laodicea, the the last, the seventh church that he addresses. He also, he begins the letter in not not a happy way. He's just saying, church, you're, you're lukewarm. I would rather you were cold or hot, but you're just lukewarm. You're somewhere in the middle. And he said, and, and here was the remedy. Check this out, the remedy especially considering that Jesus is with us, in us already. He's like, behold, I stand at the door of your life and knock. It's like we've kind of relegated God to the outside, to the yard, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and I will dine with him and he will dine with me. Do you see that that relational piece? It is possible for us to be indwelt by God's spirit. Jesus with us, and yet to be kind of keeping him at arm's length and not allowing Tim, and this is the, in the last portion, the the prayer, to fill us. Uh, One line there, uh, we've already basically uh, talked about this, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It is possible, and here's the the beautiful thing too, especially if we, we, if we, recognize that, that we're kind of off path, especially if we recognize that we've been, you know, kind of seeking after fulfillment in just about every other place than God. Here's the, here's the beautiful news, is that the only thing that we need to do because God is so merciful and he's so gracious and his forgiveness is this complete, is we just simply need to confess it to him. Say, Lord, I have been offline. I wanna come back online. Please forgive me for neglecting you, heart level. I want to know you more. I want you to, to, to show me just how much your love means because when you do, I will be filled up. And, and I will go from, you know, you know the greatest test, I've shared this before, it's just so true. I can tell where I'm at heart level uh, by my prayer life. If I'm not praying for much during a day, and I, I certainly, if, if that's true, I certainly will not be praying for you. And it's, it's this kind of litmus test. It's like, oh, and now I'm old enough, been around the block enough times, like, what is wrong with you, Don? You're, you're kind of prayerless. And, and, and again, I will just, I'll get, I'll, I'll ask God to search my heart. I will get back online And I'll ask him to fill me, and guess what happens? Suddenly I'm kind of praying more about things throughout my day, and then I'm praying for you again. And I'm believing that he can change things and and do things. What stirs your affection for God? What thing can we do to help kind of stir our affections for God. I'll share it with you mine. Again, I've shared this with a few of you before. It might sound weird, but the, the, if I want to really jumpstart my relationship with God, I will head to a pleasant cemetery and I will walk around there in a quiet, peaceful place. And, and I will see gravestones and I'll, I'll be reminded that I'm not long for this world. And I'll be reminded that the greatest commandment is the, the way to live, to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbors, myself. That's the, what I can do, right, to jumpstart. 
you might have your own way. Wanted to, uh, I'm into stick figures, so we'll take a look at this here. This is, so a spiritual drift uh, happens so easily, weakened in the wilderness, laboring under law and performance, gas tank, empty, orphan mindset. I can still operate in any given day like I'm an orphan without any family and certainly without a father. I can still live that way. It's all on me. Going to grind it out, press the, you know, it's like God does not want us to live as orphans. He wants us to live as sons and daughters. And this is how the threefold prayer, we can pray for ourselves and for one another, strengthened by the spirit, comprehending Jesus' love and filled with the fullness of God. So how is your prayer life? (laughs) 